Welcome to the Pitchworks Podcast. I'm Scott McTaggart. Over the last 20 years, I've been a sales rep, a marketer, a manager, an executive, a consultant, and an advisor. This show is designed to give you access to my list of contacts so that you can learn more about how to present your ideas at work and succeed in your career. Startups and salespeople, marketers and managers, from the Epicast Network in Pittsburgh, it's the Pitchworks Podcast. Let's say one of the historical societies wants to replace a plaque or a statue or, you know, kind of revitalize a statue yeah. or part of a building. Mm-hmm. Um, they can use our funds that maybe they wouldn't have um, normally to kind of do that that project. And as we grow and as we, you know, become more profitable and uh, start to gather more funds for them, they can, our projects become bigger. Hey, everybody, it's Scott. It is Wednesday. This is your Pitchworks podcast, and I've got Matt Vendeville, who is the founder of Circa City. Circa City uh, does not sell microwaves or DVDs or anything like that. And yes, I'm going to tease him about that mercilessly. However, uh, Matt is doing good for the world, so we got to be a little bit gentle about it. Uh, Matt started a company that benefits a lot of the people that, that frankly need it and, and you know, the, their passion projects, their work, their, their local heroism a lot of times gets overlooked. So I think that's a pretty good tease. Let's jump now into the bit where I ask you for iTunes rating and reviews and tell you that I'm waiting, you know, breathlessly for your social media contact. Um, you know where to find us, Pitchworks, P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S. If you are a first-time listener, I'm going to ask you to subscribe because it just seems like good business. Um, let's go on to Matt, though. Matt has a great little startup, but he's also got a big startup lined up. I love this story, and I'm... I, it helps me talk about the fact that um, this is what it's come to. Like, this is what we have to do now is we have to plan how these larger, more complex companies are going to come out of our town. Um, that's not a complaint. It's just a fact. We, we just we need to have a better plan. And Matt was smart enough to assess the landscape and see exactly what it was that he had to do in order to launch a huge idea. He made a plan. He's working through the plan. It's what I always tell you. Success is just a list of tasks. Just check the boxes and work through them. Um, Matt's a great guy, 24 years old, setting the world on fire. I think you're going to like this week's show. All right, jumping right in here with Matthew Vendeville. Matt, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Uh, you know what? I mean, my knee's a little sore. No, I'm great. I'm great. <laughs> um, you have a cool story, and you're going to help me tell it um, on on sort of a broader, broader scale. Are you cool with that? I'm cool with that. All right. So uh, you are the founder of a... I'm going to call it retail, right? Like you're a, you're, you've got this retail thing that you started called Circa City. Correct. Yes? Correct. All right. I did my reading. You did. <laughs> so uh, I started Circa City Apparel. Um, I was walking around Pittsburgh, and there's a lot of historical buildings in Pittsburgh and landmarks, and I kind of thought to myself, what are the stories behind these buildings? Yeah. And, uh, you know, doing some more research, I kind of realized that a lot of people in my age group, maybe even, you know, above or below, don't really know the, these facts behind and, these buildings. And let's tell everybody, how old are you? I'm 24. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, I, I think it's a fair statement that, that, you know, the people in the younger age group don't necessarily know everything that's going on in right. the architecture of this building or that building. And let's be 100% blunt, they're not always even appreciating the architecture that they're walking into from one place to the next. Exactly. And they don't understand what goes into kind of revitalizing these buildings and keeping them uh, going so people can appreciate them. Yeah. So uh, I, I went even further. And um, my fiance, Kimberly Chadi, uh, her father, Paul Chadi, uh, bought a uh, historical building in Latrobe, PA. Very it's, wise, giving the fiance a shout out on the show. You're welcome. <laughs> it's almost like you learned at my knee. Hey, I'm learning. I'm learning from the best. Oh, uh, you know what? You're a quick study. Go <laughs> thank ahead. You, thank you. Uh, so you know, just seeing uh, his vision with a building that was kind of left to die. Yeah. Um, he saw the vision in it, and he he understood he understood the importance of keeping the historical integrity of the building. Mm-hmm. And um, I really think that, that that's uh, commendable. And then I kind of thought, who's doing that in Pittsburgh? Um, who's keeping these buildings alive and, and restoring them or repurposing them? And then I even thought broader, who's doing this in the country? The, 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 one of the things I really wanted to do was to kind of connect with uh, these people who are, are helping the city and revitalizing these landmarks. I love this part of the story. Okay. I, I do. Um, so 
if I understand correctly, you're going into the historical societies and the people who are actually trying to keep the architecture and the history and, and the beauty of it alive, right? Correct. And you're cutting them in. Right. It, that's genius on its own. Thank okay? you. Okay, so take that compliment. But um, is that something that you just sort of opened your eyes one morning and it was just there behind your eyelids? You just, this is what I have to do? Or did somebody, did somebody give you that idea? Well, um, there's, two, there's kind of two avenues that I, I had in my thought process. Uh, one was... The, you kind of look at Tom's shoes and a lot of these brands are giving back and you, you see the, this generation who, who buys into that. Yeah. And he, he says, oh, like th- this, I'm buying this shoe and it has a purpose. I'm going to wear them and people know this. So I really think that's important um, as a consumer that you really kind of, um, you wear clothing and, and shoes or headphones or anything that has a purpose. And um, someone who's really big on this is actually my fiance again. Uh, she's really... Um, Pushes that's two shouts. I know. I have to. I have to give her credit though. She's she's always with me, so she always gives me good ideas. That's fantastic. So um, yeah, so it's a responsible consumerism is the word she uses, Um, and I don't know if she's trademarked it yet or copyrighted it, but uh, she needs to get on it because frankly, (laughs) so I had Christine Ixick from uh, Three Rivers uh, Outdoor Company, and we spent a good bit of time talking about how Pittsburgh has become the epicenter for that that conscious consumerism, right? right? Yep. Um, And I'm very proud of it, and and. I think we need to defend it. I, that's our turf. Right. We are the we are the epicenter for startups with a conscience. I agree. And and good on you for being one of them. Thank now, you. I'm going to drive for a minute if that's cool with you. Go ahead. All right. So here's where I started to get really interested in what <laughs> in the story you wanted to tell. Right. So you have another thing that we're just going to call Secretive Stealth Project X because you're still working on it. It's nobody's business what it is. Yep. Okay. But you said to me, you said, Circus City helps me. It's a simple project that I really love, but ultimately there's something else that I'm, I've got in, in the works, in the lab. Exactly. And I think you said something about, you know, Circus City is fairly simple for you to operate. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you've got a formula. It, it works for you. The, all the stakeholders are happy. And you've got this other startup in mind, which is much more complex. And he's going to require a significant amount of funding. Right. And Circa City is kind of how you bootstrap that other thing. Exactly. And I love every inch of that. Right? Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a very serious angel investment problem in this town. Right. Like hilariously, hilariously, it's embarrassing. <laughs> okay. We, it's embarrassing in this moment. In five years, we'll forget about it. Right, because mm-hmm. in five years we will have patched over it. Someone will have shown up and started doing what was smart. Right, right. But right now, if you want that angel round, if you want somebody to show up with a check for five hundred thousand dollars, it's really hard to get there. Now there are people that are that are doing what they can. Like Innovation Works is doing what they can. Right, the Alpha Lab teams and all those folks. You know, you can get money, but in terms of a larger sum for a more complex project. That's a much more difficult thing to do, right? Right. And, um, you know, I advise different companies. I work with with people. Obviously, on a regular basis, people sit in that chair that you're sitting in, and they tell me about what they're working on. And, you know, the number one issue with with being here is how in hell do I get the money I need? Right. And I love the fact that you were just like, okay, that's just another one of the challenges that I have to overcome in order to get to the the end goal that I'm, I'm looking at. Good on you. I'm I'm real happy about that. Thank now, I, I'm curious though. Um, do you have any time pressure? Is there a time when you need to start, you know, marketing super secret stealth project X, or are you on a more casual timeline? Uh, I think that um, it's it's in the middle. I think that there's a time constraint as far as you know making sure I'm the first to market. But I also think that um, I think the idea is super new and innovative that uh, it's going to be uh, hard for someone to replicate uh, in the time or at least before me. You wily bastard. Look at you. <laughs> are you are you only doing the retail um, through an e-commerce thing 
Or are you eventually planning on going into gift shops and those kinds of things? I think e-commerce is going to be my main stream of income. Yeah. Um, but I do, I do foresee uh, once I make these relationships with the uh, historical societies. Yeah. Or uh, you know other local community groups that um, I would I, w- I can foresee myself being in their gift shops. I love this idea. Right. Right. Because I think that the this is a transaction that happens based on the affinity that you've developed for the the place that you're visiting. Right. right? Exactly. So for example, if I am at the University of Pittsburgh and there is a gift shop in the cathedral, which I don't think there is. There is. Is there? Yep. That's terrible. Anyway, <laughs> shame on you guys. Anyway. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's all cool. Just as long as the tuitions don't continue to become astronomical. <laughs> um, I feel an attachment as an alum. I want to buy a shirt and right. you sell me a cathedral learning shirt. Yeah. That's yep. From a barrier to the transaction perspective, right? I am far more likely to buy that shirt if I'm there physically. Exactly. And, and honestly, it's a lot easier in terms of targeting, right? Right. If you could, through Facebook and Twitter advertising, pick up everybody who's ever done a road trip to the Cathedral Learning, right? you'd be a millionaire. Exactly. So gift shops are cool, yep. but with it comes a ton of overhead. Right. And I think, if I'm right, that's the bit you're, you're shying away from. Right, yeah. I want to I wanna steer away from the, the overhead, the, the stock, the, yeah. the risk that comes with that. And I, kinda, I think I figured out a way to do that. Um, basically through some, some different types of drip, uh, drop shipping websites that, yeah. so basically someone will order a shirt on my, on my website yeah. and it will be sent to this company that prints my shirts Done. and then they, they ship it. Nice. So, uh, it's on demand. I don't have any, uh, stock or any risk uh, on that side of the business. Right. Right. Yeah. So, um, once you start talking gift shops, though, you're not on demand anymore. Now you're talking right. about people trying to maintain inventory levels. You're talking about minimum order quantities. It starts to get significantly more complex. So, I mean, as per usual, your mileage will vary whenever right. I say something. But, right. Um, and I think that um, that might be something that's like a, a second phase in, in the company. Yeah. As you, become, you have more capital, you build up more capital, you can start to buy some stock on your really popular shirts. And then have those uh, in gift shops or in the community tours, so people can buy them right there. So you're kind of attacking both the, the instant buy when someone really wants it then, and then also the people who can order it on the website after the tour and wait a couple, five or three or five days. I also think that um, a lot of people doing t-shirts are kind of going with what's trendy, um, basically, trendy like uh, whatever the current event is. Oh, got it. Whether yeah. it's an NFL team or like who's the next president, they're right. they're they're following that. And I think I wanted to do something, number one, that no one's ever done before. Yeah. That's kind of like my motto. Yeah. And um, also that's something that's meaningful and it helps the community around the business. So I, you think I might have some competition on my Trump shirts? I think so, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just a couple. Enough. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's good to know. Right? Yeah, I yeah. got to do my market research before right. I start my, you know, my Etsy account or whatever. Yeah, it's probably a good idea. All right. Yeah. Um, it doesn't sound, though, like this is anything that you're going to stop. Am I right? Like right. it'll continue as a, as an ongoing venture forever and ever. Amen. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, There's a lot of cities out there. There so, are a lot yeah. of cities out there, and I, I actually did want to ask you about it because um, the cost associated with going to new markets, the further you go, the cost of every shirt is going to be a little bit higher, right? When by the time you finally make it to the Pacific Ocean, right? Right. There will be plane trips and conference calls and those kinds of things baked into the cost of a shirt. Right. Um I mean, how how big of this how big of a geography do you want this to be? Well, I know I want to start in Pittsburgh because number one is local. Yeah. And uh, it has a, a good base of customers that I feel uh, are passionate about the history of Pittsburgh. And people that want you to succeed personally. Exactly. It's never a bad thing. Right. Uh, there's a lot of mentors and like you said. Yeah. And uh, maybe people who know me or or who know the people that I'll be working with. Yeah. Um, and uh, another thing is that I, I specifically partnered with um, or want to partner with historical societies and foundations because what comes with that is the um, the people who follow them, uh, they, they kind of um, have, already have email lists, they have a Facebook, they give tours, people know their name, and and not only that, they also have some of the, the 
pictures and um, different types of historical information that I would need. Yeah, you've got access. Right. And you're still figuring out the process. Exactly. Right. So, yeah, we talk about this a lot where the first time you do something, you're going to make mistakes and it's going to require like multiple meetings and everybody's going to feel a little bit silly. Right. right? Like, oh boy, you know what? The last thing I did, we didn't have to do five trips to go mm-hmm. get one task completed. And and honestly, that's part of it, right? Um, feeling stupid, unfortunately, is just part of the formula. Right. Right. And the good news is it doesn't stick, right? It mm-hmm. washes off with tomorrow's shower. Gotcha. Um, if I may... Um, I would think that you can also, to a certain extent, start thinking in terms of where are the strongest affinities, right? Like what are people most passionate about? Right. Right. Uh, universities are a huge one, right? Um, so I have good friends who are just 20 years later, super invested in college football games because yep. this is where I happened to get that diploma on my wall. Right. Exactly. And it's like, and now if you say West Virginia <laughs> stuff is not going to go right. Right. You know? Um, so tracking those affinities would probably be a useful way for you to start to spread out. Exactly. Um, you know, I have to wonder is, is architecture a key component? Definitely. You really want it to be architecture and buildings and glass and, and the whole thing coming together. Yeah, because that's when you enter a city, um, that's what you see uh, yeah. first. You see the shape of that building. It's what catches your eye. What does the cause take out of it? What's, what's their end of this deal? They get a uh, portion of the profits. Yeah. And by doing that, we kind of work with them to figure out projects that uh, our money could be the most use of, to okay. or for. Um, so, for example, let's say... One of the historical societies wants to replace a plaque or a statue or, you know, kind of revitalize a statue yeah. or part of a building. Mm-hmm. Um, they can use our funds that maybe they wouldn't have um, normally to kind of do that, that project. And as we grow and as we, you know, become more profitable and uh, start to gather more funds for them, they can, our projects become bigger. See, and I like, and you, I, you may have done it on, on purpose or you may have just you know, had somebody lead you to it. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but having a goal that you're trying as the historical society or as the owner of the property or whatever, having a goal that you're challenging everybody to meet, I think is a key aspect of this. Right. Right. Uh, when, when high schoolers go around selling subs or pizzas or cookies or candy and they say, we're saving this up for our trip to France. People are like, well, I better buy more cookies because France is expensive. Right. Right. I love that part of it. You know, I, I, I think honestly, you should probably just start off with that. You right. Know, when, whenever you engage somebody new, if you're not doing it already, because mm-hmm. uh, that would honestly, that would, as a consumer, make me do more. Right. Uh, the photos are actually owned by them. Uh, so they're. The photos, when I finalize my partnership, yeah. um, I, I won't say who it's with until it's finalized, Very but uh, they'll have a library of photos that are copyrighted uh, only to them. Nice. So basically no one else can use those photos without a partnership. Very good. And um, so yeah, that, that's, that's another good part about this, this deal is no one else can use these photos. The, yeah. there, there are photos out there that are open, open source, but these ones are going to only be for me. Okay, so here's what I want to bring to the party. Ready? Yep. Okay, so now I've gathered all my information, and I know what your what your brand values are, and I know what you're trying to accomplish, and that may not be entirely true, but it's close enough for radio work. Okay. Um, I think we got to talk about targeted social advertising. Of course. Because the granularity of that is ridiculous at this point. Yep. Right? You can get to the point where somebody who is specifically interested in genealogy and Latrobe PA can yep. specifically be targeted. Somebody who follows the historical society can specifically be targeted. That's money in the bank. We got to do that, right? Yep, it's going to be the that's going to be the sole biggest thing that I can invest in. I would say. Yeah. But I also let me take you back a step now. Okay. Okay. So that's how we get to consumers. Right. But I also want you to think about that in terms of how to get to historical societies. Okay. Okay. I want you to think in terms of what would motivate you. If you were the kindly gentleman running the histo- historical society in Davenport, Iowa. Right. Right. 
What would convince you to call Circus City and make it an inbound call instead of an outbound call? Right. Outbound calls cost you a lot more money, right? How many people are you going to have to dial on whatever limited time you have as the person running this, the person building the other stealthy startup, right? How much time do you have just to, you know, boop, 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 boop. Hi, you don't know me, but I'm the Circus City guy. Right. No, not the appliances. <laughs> Right? Yeah. This is hard. Yeah. If you if you get three out of a hundred, you're crushing it. Right. You're just crushing it. And honestly, I think it's actually two out of a hundred when you consider that I think a lot of these are probably manned by volunteers. Right. Right. Or people like not consistently, like we're only open on Mondays from you exactly know, like ten to two. Have you already found this? Well, um, you know, everyone's different. Yeah. So there are some in Pittsburgh who have a good flow of uh revenue coming in, so they, they have you know, more staff than they're there every day, but there yeah. also are some that are, you know, open Mondays, like you said, and only for like three or four hours. See, here's what I, you know, I want to go back to the thing you said about Tom's though, right? Like I have a feeling that one of the things you're trying to do is you're trying to rescue people that don't need the, or that don't get the money right now. Right? Correct. So you don't want to be the agent and I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth. It just feels this way based on some of the other things that you've said. You don't want to be the guy where the rich get richer, right? right. Like, you know, the, Notre Dame is going to survive whether Circus City does a Notre Dame t shirt or exactly. not. Exactly. Right. Um, you know, the fine people of East Galoshes Corners, Pennsylvania, on the other hand, are going to have a serious problem. Yep. Right. And you want those people to get what they need and they don't have the tools. Right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cool enough. So, um, yeah. It's easy to get meetings or at least WebEx or, you know, phone calls with the ones that are already well funded, but it feels like that's. If you had a thousand of them, yeah, okay, you know, your startup gets funded, and that's obviously very good news. Yeah. But I think that you would, at the end of all of that, feel like you hadn't fully hit the mission. You hadn't fully completed what you set out to do. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's cool. And I think uh, one way to attack that problem yeah. is, again, using social media. I mean, most of these places at least have a Facebook page, and then you can kind of use direct messaging, which I think is super important now. Yeah. It's becoming more popular. It feels a little spammy, right? right. So we got to get around that. We got to, again, we got to turn inbound or outbound calls into inbound calls. Well, I think if you can turn it into showing that you can provide value to them yeah. first and then say, hey, this is maybe what you can return. Okay, so here's a weird question. Is mm -hmm. there a convention for historical societies? That's a great question. Well, it's also weird, as I said. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of adjectives that apply here. I wouldn't be surprised if there is. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, I mean, so you're not charging them anything up front. No, no, I don't charge them anything. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So in other words, if you came to me, now I'm the boss of the historical society, right? And yeah. Matt comes in, right? And, and you're a volunteer. Cause again, a lot of these, especially the people who really need the funding are going to be volunteers and I, nothing against volunteers. Right. Yeah. But they're typically not that well read into like how do we do things? What mm -hmm. are our values? What's a thing that you need to bring to my attention? Exactly. Who should our vendors be? The volunteers are not part of any of that, right? right. But they do answer the phone. Yep. Yeah. So we got to get wherever the, the role that I'm playing is the, the director of the historical site. We got to get there, right? Okay. Um, and if there is a convention for them and it's possible, I don't know. It feels like a lot of the ones you're trying to reach aren't going to be able to get to that conference. So... Right. I, I'm, I'm treading very lightly here, right? Um, maybe there's a magazine, right? Maybe there's a, a mailing list, right? Yeah. But we have, to, we have to operate as though what we're selling is for people that are economically disadvantaged, right? Okay. Not so much because the person who runs the historical society is, you know, himself personally economically disadvantaged or herself, right? It's got to be because the way they use their funds is different, which means it doesn't put them in circulation frequently enough with enough spare time right. to willingly accept your message. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we're back to social, right? We're back to magazines and mailing lists and, you know, if there's a website that they belong to, ancestry type things. I mean, good Lord. Yeah. Can you imagine being part of one of those those small town kind of things and getting 5,000 calls from people that will not donate five bucks for the work you just put in. Right. Like I, I worked on this for four days. Great. <laughs> well, can, can you tip the historical society? 
Oh, sorry, I got a bad connection. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, your princess is in another castle. Anyway, right. um, that's the trick, though. And I, I think- don't think it's a problem of anything other than just getting to a place where they have time and inclination to listen to the message because you said you're not charging them anything. Right. So by definition, when that volunteer comes in, I'm at least willing to accept it because free fits into every budget. Right. I think one of the strategies that I had um, was to attack cities like Pittsburgh, metro cities, and then, and then scale up to bigger cities. And then from there, hopefully the name gets out and then we can start working on, the, on those economic, you know, the, the, uh, the historical societies who, who need the money, the money the most. Yep. Um, the other thing that interests me out of all of this is to what extent can somebody just go and be your representative on a short term basis? Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've got somebody in a town. I mean, let's do this full gorilla for a second, right? Mm -hmm. Not, yeah, not, uh, but the other kind, um, (laughs) the, um, you know, the idea that somebody college educated like you are doesn't know somebody in all these major cities mm-hmm. is just, that's not one of the possibilities, right? So you call up your friend in Seattle, Washington, which is a very inconvenient flight from Pittsburgh, by the way. Yep. Don't take that if you don't have to. Um, and you say, hey, I need you to be my agent for two weeks. That might be, a, as a 1099, that might be a smart play for you. Yep. Oh, well, what am I going to have to do? You know, we want right. you to murder the president. No, um, <laughs> no, we, we want you to go to the historical society of Redmond, Washington, which isn't doing so hot. Uh huh. Right. Um, that's a smart move. Either that or, uh, you know, you could take your lovely and talented fiance on a really long, weird Winnebago ride all across. <laughs> <laughs> Just be like, you know, the most serpentine yep. trip across America's highway system. American tour. <laughs> yeah, I hope you love grilling out. Anyway, yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you can do that, you know, you've got sort of like a little weaponized network of friends around that are willing to go and just be, you know, authorized sales agents on a short term basis. Yep. Let's get that done. You just need boots on the ground. And I think there's a lot of options to do that. Uh, you, have, you have college kids. You have people who are spread out all over the nation who are yeah. more than willing to do something like this. And, and again, the costs of running a, a historical society are not going down. Right. They're going up. Imagine just what it takes to secure some of these old buildings that have been landmarked. Exactly. Right? It's like, okay, well, we got to keep people from going in there. And by the way, you're not allowed to drill anything, cut anything, put on a padlock, I yep. mean, the costs have got to be spiral- spiraling out of control. For of them. course. And buildings aren't getting younger, so. It's true, too, yeah. right? Um, uh, is that the Pennsylvanian on your, on your shirt that you're wearing? It is. It is. I love the Pennsylvanian. Yep. That's a great building. Thank you. Um, if people wanted to check out the inventory, find out what's available for sale, where would they go? Circacity.org. Circacity.org. Yep. And I, C-I-R-C-A. Yep. C-I-T-Y. Correct. Dot org. If you're anything like me, you're going to you're gonna type dot com three times before you remember the truth. <laughs> and yes, I, I realize that that does not cast me in the best light, but it's still true. I go dot com, and then I go, oh, that's right. It's right, the it's, other kind. It's dot org. <laughs> yeah, it's a dot org. Don't mess that up. But, and then uh, what should people expect to pay for a shirt when they get there? $25 for the shirt. Yep. And uh, 20% goes to charities or historical societies. Very good, man. Yep. And uh, for all your listeners, 15% off if they type in Pitchworks with a capital P. So when does that expire? Uh, it's going to expire December 18th. So uh, you can oh, just get it. a week it. before Christmas. Exactly, exactly. Man, <laughs> that's smart thinking. Matt Vendeville, Circa City, and some, uh, you have to, hang on, wait, we're not exiting you just yet. You have to agree to come back on whenever the other thing stops being like top secret under a veil project, okay? I promise. Because I'm not sure I can hold this forever. I'll be back. All right. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Oh, man, I had fun. Me too. All right, everybody. That is all the time we've got this week. Thanks to Matt Vendeville. We appreciate him coming in. And frankly, again, I think he's very, very smart for having just taken the the landscape in stride the way he did. He said, okay, if... If angel funding is going to be a challenge, then I'm not going to take angel funding as much as I'm going to just create my own. And don't let me speak for him on that. I'm sure if some angel investor who's wise beyond his years decides to cut a check for this this next thing, I promise you won't be disappointed. I know what it is. Um, Don't forget, he gave us all a coupon code. You have to use it by 1218-2017. Pitchworks with a capital P. And uh, 
you know, hopefully that'll help you do your holiday shopping and you'll benefit the historical societies in the meantime, which ain't half bad. So uh, hit us up on the social media. You know where to find us. Pitchworks, P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S. We will be back in the lab making another show for you. It'll be back back out here in about seven days and uh, we'll catch you then. The Pitchworks Podcast comes to you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A production of the Epicast Network and McTaggart, LLC. Engineering and production by Buzzy Torek and Nick Miller. For more information, show feedback, and ad sales, visit pitchworks.com. E-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S dot com. On social media, find and follow the show on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram using that same brand name. P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.